Twitter. Thank you very much for coming out this evening. Uh, we all know we have busy schedules, but we realize how important, how critical this issue is to a community. So thank you very much. Uh, just to um, discuss what um, the district manager was uh, raising a while ago, going forward, we will be having to take votes on various issues. And to be able to do that, it's uh, necessary to be a member of a committee. So I'm encouraging you to join up, uh, contact Ms. Frazier and um, send in a form, whatever you need to do, so that you can be part of this community, uh, co committee. The other thing is that just to let you know, you can serve on various committees. In fact, the borough president encourages uh, members of the board to be on at least three committees. So please don't feel that if you're on one committee, then you know, you're limited in your participation in another committee. So thank you very much. Um, Ms. Rosa, do we take a roll call this time since we are not? Um, is she, Ms. Rosa? Okay. Um, Sorry, I had muted myself. Do we need a roll call since we no, don't mean, do we need a no, roll call for tonight? Those, for those who are here, the problem here is that um, I sent out over 75 um, uh, emails, and that is why it's so important for members to register who wants to be a part of the committee, so we will know whether or not we have a quorum. But if you would like to ask everyone to introduce themselves, that's fine. Sure, okay. Why don't we start with... Uh, then I'm just going to go across my screen. Um, the telephone number ended with two five. Yolanda Aline. I'm one. I'm going to become a committee member. Fantastic. Go ahead. Adele Bennett. Okay, I was a committee member, but yes, I'm going to become a committee member. Yes. Fantastic. Okay. Alexandra. She made Schmidt Schmidt Bauer. Yes, hi. Okay, I'm here. okay. Okay, great. And welcome. Uh, Alicia Boyd. Hi, my name is Alicia Boyd. I'm your neighbor in uh, CB9. Great, fantastic. Um, Allison Martinez. President committee member. Angela Williams. Hello, good evening. I'm interested in joining the committee. Fantastic. Edwin Joseph. Yes, good afternoon, good evening. Sorry. Great. <clears throat> Hazel Martinez. Hazel Martinez, good evening. Hi, good evening. Welcome. Jay Sorid. Um, hello, uh, Jay Sorid. I'm interested in events that uh, can affect CB9 and also um, CB17 and more of the uh, eastern part of the district as it relates to uh, oversaturation of social services. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, Margarita Vigilante. Hi, it's Marguerite Filiante. I'm a board member of CB17, and I guess I'm a committee member of this committee, or hoping to be. Okay. You uh, are. <laughs> uh, Kenrick Wesco. Mr. Westcott. Okay, we'll come back to him. Mary Bell Downs. Okay, we'll come back to her. Um, Ms. Smith. Board member, committee member, Mary Bell Downs. Good evening to all. Good evening. Ms. Smith. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rhea Smith. Um, some of you may know me for a variety in a variety of capacities in the community. Tonight, I am here as a community resident, very interested in the work that the rezoning committee might 
is going to be doing and exploring the opportunity of possibly joining. I'm interested in the areas of community board 17, 9, and um, any others that would be um, appropriate for the for the goals that you all are setting and the initiatives you're setting in the committee. Great. Teresa Barrington. Good evening, Teresa Brereton, community board member, and I would love to be on this committee. Great. Welcome. T.S. Handy. Hello, Kim. I'm on the board. Uh, I'm not a board member. I'm not sure if I'm a member of this committee, but I um, would love to be a member of this committee. Um, yeah, you're back. Great. Vanessa Kwashi. Hi, Vanessa Kwashi. Good evening, committee member. Good evening. Welcome. Well, again, thank you all for coming out this evening. We have a very important task facing us as a committee. Uh, the fact is that one, <coughs> while other districts did rezone over the past decade, we did not. And then two, what's happening is unplanned development in our community. And because of that, persons who don't live here, who have no vested interest in the community are able to rightfully, to a certain extent, <laughs> um, take advantage of the lack of rezoning. So what we as a board are gonna be, as a committee will be doing, is be working on rezoning trying to identify areas in the community whereby we would have to upzone because things have changed. Whereas in the past couple of years, uh, there were less restrictions on rezoning. Uh, given the city mandates right now, in order to rezone, we have to include components or uh, we have to consider affordable housing. That's why we have a guest speaker tonight who is going to discuss what affordable housing is, what it isn't, and um, help us to see how it can be incorporated into the rezoning plan that we ultimately come up with. Because without that component of affordable housing, we're not going to be successful. And even more than that, we, we, we need to recognize as a committee that there are people in our community who are struggling with getting affordable housing. So while we want to preserve the contextual nature of our community, it's important to realize that we're gonna it's gonna have to be a give and take. If we don't give a little, we're not gonna get what we want. Um, we all have a vested interest in maintaining our housing stock. Uh, that's inter intergenerational transfer of wealth. And we know what happens very often is that when we lose that star, we forever lose that ability to pass it on to our children and our grandchildren. So there are many reasons why rezoning is critical. And um, tonight I am delighted that we have um, with us James Lloyd, who is the Director of Policy at New York State Association for Affordable Housing, and he is going to be speaking to us in a minute or two. I just want to bring up one thing that was um, raised at our last mi um, meeting. The fact is that if you do see development um, taking place, please, either if you can't do it yourself, uh, speak to the people on the block and just ensure that the developer has a legal right based on the deed to be able to develop that property as they think. Because what happens very often is what the zoning permits may not be permitted itself by the deed. So let's be vigilant. Let's ensure that any, un any development in our community is consistent with the legal restrictions placed on it. Um, any questions before I turn it over to Mr. Law, James Lloyd? Okay. Well, thank you. At this time, I'm delighted to have uh, James Lloyd with us. And um, would you like to share? Um, do you need to share your screen? Yes, I will. Um, 
thought I'd quickly introduce myself and I'll kick right off in the presentation. So, my name's uh, James Lloyd. I, you know, director of policy at NYSAFA, uh, and I'm actually a resident of community board of uh, community district 17. I live at the southeast corner of Bedford and Lenox. Uh, so, I'm a member of this community. And I, my background, it was interesting uh, that this is a discussion around a, your idea of a potential neighborhood rezoning. I worked at the New York City Council for four years, uh, during which I was the New York City Council project manager for the, the East New York and Inwood neighborhood rezoning. So I've been around the block a few times with that. Um, and so, and I'm an urban planner uh, by training. Um, so with that, let me go ahead and share my screen. And let's see. Okay. All right. Can you all? Uh, you can all see the uh, slide deck here. Yes. All right. See nods. Um, so we uh, we developed this presentation as a affordable housing overview for the New York City Council for the new members who came in at the beginning of this year. Uh, we did it in conjunction with the NYU Furman Center. That's a housing focused recent research center at New York University. And of course, with enterprise. Uh, so here's a little um, background on uh, the various organizations. Uh, obviously, Furman Center are the uh, for if you want data or empirical research on housing, they're probably the best folks in the country and they're focused on New York City. Of course, Enterprise Community Partners, a national nonprofit organization founded by James Rouse in 1982, uh, focused on community development, uh, affordable housing development, and heavily focused on fair housing eviction protection in New York. And then NYSAFA, uh, the organization that employs me, uh, it's New York's affordable housing trade group. So we represent all the affordable housing developers, architects, accountants, attorneys, so on and so forth across uh, the city and state. We have 400 members, largest affordable housing trade group in the country, uh, and responsible for the vast majority of affordable housing built across the city and state. So we have regular meetings with HPD commissioner, uh, HCR commissioner, um, department of buildings, department of city planning, so on and so forth. And of course, Kirk Goodrich from Monadnock is our chair. So that'll go ahead and kick off into the substance of the presentation. So, what is affordable housing? Um, so, there's you know, a lot of different terms that are thrown around. So, we thought we would sort of define define our terms to begin with. Um, so, most people are familiar with uh, public housing, uh, most famously, uh, NYCHA, right? New York City Housing Authority. It's enormous. The New York City has the biggest affordable, uh, biggest public housing uh, stock and authority in the country. Um, close to 180,000 units, and it houses the most vulnerable New Yorkers, right? With their average family income being about $25,000. And that is all publicly owned and operated by NYCHA with support coming from the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD. Um, that contrasts with privately owned affordable housing. So most of the time in the land use world and the world of rezonings, when we talk about affordable housing, we're talking about this privately owned affordable housing, which is the the way that ever since really the 70s, how we have developed new affordable housing uh, in the city and state, right? And so these are buildings built with uh, low income housing tax credits, built with city and state subsidy. Uh, and so you can see HPD, HDC, HCR, these various, you know, alphabet soup of city and state housing agencies um, have uh, have given have you know entered into contracts with private developers to build affordable housing um, with public subsidy. So there's in New York City they're around uh, 287,000 units, and statewide they're close to 400,000 units of this type of privately owned and operated affordable housing. And this affordable housing relies on a federal tax credit called a low income housing tax credit. Um, for its primary source of subsidy, uh, and that targets um, that services families around 60% of area median income, which we will discuss later. AMI, of course, as you all know, if you've been involved in this world, is a contentious um, but important metric. And so you can see it's about $64,000 for a family of three. Um, but that's not the only type of privately owned affordable housing. There's also uh, supportive housing. 
uh, it's about 35,000 units. Um, and so that, of course, is has operating subsidies and social services for the residents who are often formerly homeless. Uh, and then, of course, we have other things like uh, Section 8. So with that, I'll move on to the vouchers. So we have um, so vouchers, of course, are mobile. So you if you are fortunate enough to receive a Section 8 voucher where you have to be uh, no more than 50 percent area median income, then most of the time you're at 30 percent. Um, then that will make up be, uh, the difference between what your family can afford and your actual rent. Uh, and that uh, serves a, over 100,000 families uh, in New York City. And of course, there's also a city, ver a city voucher as well called City FEPS. Um, and some buildings too are, are they essentially take vouchers and assign them to a unit, and then that's a project based section eight. So that is the primary way that we uh, house the lowest income uh, New Yorkers. Um, but beyond that, there's also um, a, another type of affordable housing and call, often called inclusionary housing and, or you may have heard of 421A, uh, a tax exemption. And these are mixed income buildings. So these are buildings that are mostly market rate, right? 75% market rate or thereabouts. And then in exchange for around a quarter of the building being affordable, then uh, they will get, uh, the developer will get a tax uh, tax exemption. Um, for inclusionary housing under zoning, there may be a sort of bonus. So they may be able to build the building taller. Uh, these are content, you know, 420A is highly contentious. So I don't, uh, <laughs> I'd rather not talk too much about that. Um, but uh, this is, if you're, Thinking about a neighborhood rezoning, then mandatory inclusionary housing will be an important topic of discussion. And you can just see on the right hand side of the screen some examples of uh, different types of housing. So, under the first houses was the very first NYCHA development, and it was completed in uh, 1936 before they sort of moved to the tower in the park uh, model. Uh, and then you contrast that up in East Harlem, El Barrio's art space, PS 109, 90 units of affordable act artist housing along with 10,000 square feet of space for arts organizations. So that's sort of from the very beginning of affordable housing to sort of the state of the art uh, across the city. So also uh, we have rent regulated housing. So you may have heard of rent controlled, rent stabilized housing. I personally live in a rent stabilized unit and it's great. Um, now this is privately owned, unsubsidized and fully taxed housing typically. Uh, and there are a million units of this. Uh, rent stabilization generally applies to units with six or more, uh, excuse me, buildings with six or more units built before 1974. Of course, uh, in the 90s, they started sort of poking holes in the rent laws, and a lot of units exited stabilization, but then other units have been added uh, over time by other programs. And these annual rent increases are governed by the Rent Guidelines Board. So. These type of housing are this type of housing is not typically subsidized or subject to regulatory agreements. So when we say affordable housing, we're not typically talking about privately owned, unsubsidized, rent regulated housing. Um, and pardon me, that's just my dog, Ellie. Um, so where is affordable housing located? So this. Um, the, the current system for affordable housing developed in the 1980s. And most of this was uh, based off of, you know, the city during the bad days of the 70s, um, a lot of landlords just walked away from their buildings. Uh, they sought paying their taxes and the city ended up foreclosing on them and seizing these properties due to this non-payment of taxes. You can see this photo from the North, South Bronx in 1980. Um, and the model was that the city used low income housing tax credits. I keep on referring to this. These are these federal uh, federal tax credits for the production of affordable housing. They use low income housing tax credits to rehabilitate these seized apartment buildings. And uh, after they ran out of new apartment buildings, they used these housing tax credits to build new housing from scratch. Um, the the challenge now is that the city doesn't have much of this land left. They've already rehabbed all these buildings. They've already essentially used up all their public land. 
And so these days, uh, affordable housing developers will often go out and buy land uh, and then uh, enter into a deal with the city uh, to use city funding to build affordable housing. So that's so we're sort of at the very tail end of one type of development where it's predominantly city land and moved on to using private land for affordable housing. And so this is a, a map showing you where it's all located. And this is from the uh, from the Furman Center. Uh, pardon me, one moment. You would never know that my dog had already eaten dinner. Um, so this map depicts where so, this yeah, affordable housing. Meeting. Sorry, this uh, this. Uh, one minute, please. One minute, please. Would you please all mute yourselves? Thank you. So this this map um, depicts where affordable housing is located, and so this is from the Furman Center that I referenced earlier. So if you all are ever interested in data or research on housing, um, I strongly encourage you uh, to, to speak with them or I can always connect you. But as you can see, the South Bronx and places like East New York, Lower East Side are uh, as a heavy, heavy concentration of affordable housing. And you can see all the various types of programs, Mitchell Lamas, Low Income Housing Tax Credits, Public Housing, so on and so forth. So that, but those were the areas hardest hit by the 70s uh, in REM crisis. And so that's where these areas are concentrated. So, um, so this is sort of moving on to how it's built, how it's developed. And, and this is again for affordable housing for 100% uh, projects. So, you know, you start off with site, site identification, site selection and site control. So a, a developer, a 100% affordable developer, like Monadnock, for instance, or Kirk Goodrich, might find a site and get it for a good price. And then from there, I'll work on, um, you know, look at the zoning, look at um, the environmental, uh, work on making a deal with the city for subsidy, um, and then move into construction lease up. So you can see it's a long process. Um, and uh, for folks, uh, certainty around funding, certainty around sites and zoning is, is very important during this. And then, of course, operations, you know, these now nowadays when people enter into regulatory agreements, that's for the very, very long term. And then how is it paid for? Right? So. Affordable housing is, uh, you know, you have loans. From the from the city, so I say HTC or HFA. So HTC is the Housing Development Corporation. That's a city corporation uh, that loans money for affordable housing. And HFA is a state agency, the Housing Finance Agency. So they will issue low or no interest loans for affordable housing, uh, sometimes funded by the sale of tax exempt bonds. You also have conventional loans from private banks. So that's the debt side. Then you also have what they call the equity side. Um, so that's capital subsidies through HPD or, or the state agency, HCR, the federal low income housing tax credit. Um, and then of course, a tax exemption, right? So we've talked on the one hand about how to pay for it, but another great way to make a building more affordable is to reduce its expenses. And so if you give the site a tax exemption, they don't have to pay tax. And so that means they need less rent, which means the apartments can be more affordable. So all of these tools um, go in to, um, to, to financing affordable housing. Now, how are residents selected? Very contentious or very important. So there is a lottery process um, through Housing Connect is the website, and it's based off of the area median income. So this is a regional, area median income is the yardstick, and it's a region, uh, regional tool, and it's based off of New York City plus some surrounding counties in uh, in New York in the Hudson Valley, um, and it's set 100% of area median income is currently set at $107,000 for a family of three, and so you'll have various percentages based off of that. Uh, and each financing program from the city uh, will have a term sheet we call it um, 
so which essentially the city's offer that says we'll give you x amount of money um of equity uh in exchange for producing affordable housing at certain income levels so for instance right now the city's uh ella term sheet the extremely low and low income affordability program uh provides for they're essentially opening offers one hundred twenty two thousand dollars a unit that the city will pay in equity uh, for development. Now, there are units set aside there uh, in the process. Um, there's, of course, 50% of units are reserved for residents of the local community district. And additionally, there are some units set aside for municipal employees for the handicapped. Um, there's a variety of, of set asides in this, but it's all done through 1 central. Uh, city run website. Now, um, we're talking about ensuring long term affordability. So, you know, part of this is. You know, it's great to build a shiny new building, but then you also have to maintain the affordable housing after they run, uh, run in after the tenants all move in. And, you know, the city and state have asset management teams that work with private developers to make sure that these buildings aren't. Uh, falling apart um, that are compliant um, and that are have adequate capital needs. Um, so, for instance, these days we're having a huge problem um, in the city and sort of the hangover unintended consequences from some of our pandemic programs. And so there's some big problems with some buildings and we're trying to work with the governor and her people to address it. So, uh, originally, I made this for the city council um, and, but I thought it would, you all would be sort of be interested in finding out how the city council is involved. Because, of course, as you know, in ULERP, uh, the uniform land use review procedure, uh, the community board is the beginning, particularly the land use committee. Uh, and then, of course, it ends at the city council. And so the council has to approve all, uh, you know, all ULERPs. But also all dispositions of property, uh, some tax exemptions, and of course the city council members have what they call Reso A or Resolution A funds, where they can directly contribute some mem member funds to affordable projects. And of course the council is also involved in allocating capital to HPD to build these affordable housing. Uh, but if you all went through with your uh, rezoning plan, if you worked with the Department of City Planning to do a rezoning, it would eventually end up at the City Council and they would map what they call map a mandatory inclusionary housing district during upzoning, uh, probably along major commercial corridors. And you can see the smiling faces of Council Member Rafael Salamanca, uh, the chair of the Land Use Committee, and of course, Council Member Prina Sanchez, chair of Housing and Buildings. Um, and yeah, so this is really about t a lot of tension among various public goals. So, you know, if you sort of go out to the citywide level, the city has a certain amount of capital, or we call capital, same thing as subsidy. And, you know, there's different tensions. So some folks want really deep affordability, which is probably a major topic um, sort of in this part of the city. Uh, and deep affordability does require more subsidy, more public money per unit than uh, units at higher incomes, right? Um, so it's sort of a question of who needs this housing the most, how sustainable are buildings, um, and you know how much money does the city have available? And of course, also the location of buildings as well also involves trade-offs. Um, so, for instance, if you build uh, housing in a lower income neighborhood, their land is often cheaper or the city may still own some land, for instance, out in East New York. And then you can get uh, a lot more units per dollar and it can be much more affordable. Um, however, you know, you don't. Uh, but if you build housing in a high opportunity neighborhood, um, maybe with better access to jobs or different schools, it can be more expensive. But oftentimes residents can be more impactful for residents. So, for instance, this is all playing out um, over, I think, Five World Tra Trade Center, a site in the World Trade Center campus that some folks are calling for to be 100% affordable. And that's a great example of these different trade offs. So, it's a very, it's a building with a core, it'd be very high construction costs. So, you, it would be right there in World Trade Center, right there in lower Manhattan. So, very high opportunity neighborhood. 
but also be extremely expensive and take a lot of public subsidy. So it's sort of, you know, do you want your subsidy to go for more units or do you want them to be all in one building in lower Manhattan? And then uh, some threats, threats to affordable housing, right? And the continued development of it. So for one, uh, costs, we all know about inflation. Well, that's been very directly manifested in the development business. So there's increased construction costs. So folks may not know, but it costs somewhere between four and $500 a square foot to build affordable housing. In New York, so if you think about a 750 square foot uh, one bedroom apartment, um, that takes about a thousand total square feet of building space because of corridors and so on. So that costs somewhere between four and five hundred thousand dollars to build, excluding land costs or developer fee. So when you see you know condominiums advertised for sale in this neighborhood for around six hundred thousand dollars, which seems crazy. And then you peel back the math and you're realizing they're more or less selling them. Uh, I mean, they're making money, but not a lot, right? They're, it, that's more or less cost when you include developer fees. Um, and so we have huge challenges with that operations costs, insurance. This is like the worst place to insure in the country uh, and material costs with the pandemic supply chain. Um, but also over time, right? So if you can't maintain the building over time, uh, if you don't have enough income coming in from rent to uh, contribute to capital reserves, then you might have to recapitalize the building. And uh, everyone loves it when you rehabilitate an affordable building and, and fix it up. But also the money that the public is spending on that, they're not spending on new affordable housing. So you're sort of robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, so it's wonderful to see and preservation is really important. Um, and we don't want these units to fall out of the affordable stock or to have, you know, or to, or to lose these units. Um, but understand that the, every money dollar we spend to fix up an affordable building um, is a dollar we're not spending to build a new one. Um, and then also lack of land and lack of almost important zoning capacity. So obviously we mentioned we sort of a run out of public land uh, and the, and then we have this zoning issue. As you mentioned, you know, this is a great. Um, this is really works very well with what you're looking about now. So this this neighborhood, you know, wasn't necessarily wasn't rezoned. I'm very familiar with that. I live in an R7 district here, and so you see new buildings popping up all the time. Uh, a lot of other communities were down zoned under Bloomberg, so you won't necessarily see the same type of development there. Um, and so you end up with a lot of development concentrated in this neighborhood. But, you know, the for build more affordable housing, we really need more zoning capacity available all over the city and really all over the region and state. Uh, a third of the units built for the total new housing units built over the last decade were built in areas that had been up zoned. So uh, the new zoning really makes a big, uh, a big issue, a big impact. And of course, the suburbs like to go off to Long Island and they just generally don't allow um, any new multifamily at all. Um, and then, of course, there's local opposition, right? So um, communities rightfully ask, why should we be, why should we shoulder all the burden of our solving our housing crisis right here? Um, and also tenants who even are fortunate enough to get section out, section eight vouchers often face uh, discrimination on the marketplace. So that, I think we're at what, 27 minutes? So I think I hit my time time mark. Um, here's some further resources and myself, but I'm happy to take, if you are fine with that, I'm happy to take any questions if uh, folks would like, or if you would like me to take them. Yes, certainly. Thank you very much. I'm going to open the, the floor for questions. Um, please don't be uncomfortable asking hard questions. I just ask that you ask them as um, nicely as possible. So, uh, any hands? I will close my screen. Um, you know, I can't see all the hands, so you can just go ahead if you have a question. Okay, Alicia Boyd. Hi, my name is Alicia Boyd, and I noticed that you talked about the fact that um, in the zoning, you're talking about mandatory inclusionary housing. Um, and you talked about that you were involved in both the East New York and up, up in Manhattan zonings. 
And is, is it not true that the community themselves were not happy with the mandatory inclusionary housing program because it actually did not create housing that was affordable to the local residents, that the choices that were given to developers within that program allows them to target people who make up to $175,000 and that in fact, that program has not actually produced um, housing, and I will put on the quotes, affordable uh, housing that actually um, would provide um, the residents in the community with housing and then actually cause a major uh, shift of residents being removed from the community as a result of apartments that were being labeled as affordable but actually were market rate. Would you like to address that? Sure. I mean, I, I don't share that uh, view. Um, in terms of mandatory inclusionary housing and the incomes it addresses, uh, there are four options under the program, but the during the ULERP, uh, different options are typically, uh, typically only one or two are actually mapped. So, for instance, you were alluding to the very higher income, the sort of uh, option, that's what we call the workforce housing option. To my knowledge, that's only ever been mapped one time in the East, Southeast Bronx and Throgs Neck, where there wasn't a lot of appetite for affordable housing, to be honest. And uh, East New York, the two options were option one, where it just averages out to 60% of area median income, but includes a band at 40% of area median income, and the deep affordability option, which is 20% of the units at 40% of area median income. Um, there's been an enormous amount of 100% affordable developed out in East New York as a result of that rezoning, um, included by FIPS and also by Cypress Hills uh, Local Development Corporation. So I'd see generally it's been a, it's been highly impactful in terms of affordable housing uh, development in that area. Now, you know, I think it was a challenging process. I think there was speculation because a lot some speculators did not understand the the what they would have to fulfill through mandatory inclusionary housing. And when they heard that the area was going to go through a rezoning, thought that it was going to be like how it had been under Bloomberg. And, uh, and they paid way too much for sites and um, there was some unfortunate speculation. But by the time we did Inwood, you, you weren't seeing that type of speculation happening. So I, I think it's been highly impactful, highly beneficial to the communities. Now, and, but of course, if you, for the, Deepest, deepest affordability, it's really project based section 8 that will get the folks like at public housing levels. But yeah, um, and I think there are some questions in the chat. Um, economics of affordable housing are sustainable. Um, so, and do you think that in part explains the move away from mom and pop and towards developers? So, uh, I would say that economics, affordable housing are 100% sustainable. The, um. For mixed income buildings, it relies on a cross subsidy from the market rate units to the affordable units. And for 100% affordable, it is underwritten or it is financed very carefully um, to make it sustainable over time. Now, you do see some older buildings, like some Mitchell Llamas, that are distressed and that need recapitalization, that need to be rehabilitated. Um, so, and that is you know, being addressed actively by the city and state. Uh, and of course, in terms of moving away from smaller developers and towards larger developers, I think part of that is capacity and balance sheet. So some of our members are, you know, we represent the whole industry. Some are small community driven developers and some are larger. And often the larger ones have more financing available, have larger staffs available. And so because of that capacity, they can execute really big projects. Uh, and then definitions of upzoning and downzoning. So, uh, typically, when we say upzoning, we would mean you are increasing the amount of floor area that can be built, and you're typically increasing heights. Um, 
it's slightly complicated because a lot of this area may be R7 uh, or parts of it, and they're not necessarily height limits on it today. But you would, um, in the down zoned area, you would reduce the amount of floor area you can build to reduce the number of apartments you could build on a site and reduce the height. And in an up zoned area, you would increase it. So if you up zone a corridor, you would likely see those buildings torn down and redeveloped as bigger buildings. And if you down zone an area or provided a contextual rezoning, you would likely see those buildings preserved and not changed. Um, and I think Ms. Martinez, you have your hand up. Yes, um, please call me Allison. I just wanted yes, to ask if, um, if you all are starting to track or noticing any of the wholesaling that we're seeing happening across the country with hedge funds buying up single family homes, are you doing any tracking or trending or seeing any of those trends starting to affect New York at all? So uh, I think over time, private equity has become more and more active in New York. Um, before the 2019 rent laws, I think there was a lot of, you know, some of it entering into the rent stabilized stock. Um, I would say most recent, uh, and, and you know, like our chair, Kirk, Kirk Goodrich, is very concerned with things like deed theft and other signs of abuse. Um, there, uh, what we are seeing now in New York, because there isn't isn't as much opportunity for new housing development that some of this big private equity money is repositioning existing buildings um, to for higher incomes. So that means going into a building, rehabilitate, rehabilitating it and kicking out the existing tenants. So that's not what we're doing. That's not what our members doing. They're doing affordable housing, but some big money is focused on that because there are fewer places to develop new housing. Um, but yes, the, uh, you know, private money can have good effects when it can provide the needed resources to, to build new affordable, um, or build new housing, but it can also, you know, serve to accelerate change. Sydney Rolock, did you have a question? Uh, and it says, what is community board 17 currently slated for in terms of development? I don't have that at my disposal, unfortunately, but I, you know, I live in community board 17 and I see a lot of new buildings going up all the time on my block. <laughs> yes, I, 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 I see the same thing. So that's why I was asking. And uh, it seems to be a very aggressive push uh, as well uh, in that in that regard, especially with higher, as you now define this up zoning versus down zoning, thank you. Uh, there seems to be more, I'll say, higher level type buildings going up. Question? Yes, that's there are, um, you know, new building, new buildings command a premium. Uh, new buildings command a premium in terms of rents. Um, there is some interesting research that recently came out uh, or that the Furman Center recently highlighted. And showing that you know a new new buildings will often lower the rents in the existing buildings around them, um, but there is a lot of new development happening in this community. Predominantly, um, as Ms. James mentioned, this this community never received the rezonings that a lot of other communities um, received under the Bloomberg years or under the Blasio years, and so because of that, it has this zoning back from 1961 that does not have height limits and often requires a lot of parking. So you'll see a building built with a lot of parking provided. Sometimes it goes really, really high because it has that old zoning or you could do that. Um, and it is a dramatic change in the, in the neighborhood and you see a lot of development here concentrated because of the old zoning. Understand. So just another question then. So maybe this is a broader question, but what is CB 17's objectives relative to rezoning? So, so what are we trying to accomplish for the, for the, uh, for the community board question? So that I would say that's a question for you all to think about among yourselves, as opposed to, to, to me. Um, I, what I can lay out for you is what you would expect to hear back from Department of City Planning 
who is probably who you would be speaking to. Uh, you know, Department of City Planning, their goals are to increase housing production. Um, so they will likely, if you if you want to talk to them about doing a rezoning, they'll likely, you know, want to identify corridors that could be upzoned, and then of course areas where that you would like to downzone or current or provide height limits and contextual rezoning. So that is almost certainly what what they would want to do if they wanted decided to take take on a big project like this, because of course the neighborhood rezoning is a big project for community. Um, so not not to monopolize, but the last question, I guess this is for JL James then. So basically is CB17 trying to close a loophole uh, based on the Bloomberg administration, not, you know, rezoning either up or down, but this just being kind of saying a, a free for all? Yeah, well, since we lost the opportunity back um, then, and since we are now faced with higher hurdles, the question for this committee is how do we address it? So to that end and to your question, what would be very helpful is if all the members um, think of a mission. So we can have one statement, one voice. So for next month's agenda, it would be to spend some time developing a mission, a vision. So when someone asks, what is the role? What is the purpose? What is the goal? What is the aim of this rezoning committee? We would have a statement. So I kindly ask you to give it some thought um, so that next week, next month, we can generate a statement to answer anybody what is it specifically we're trying to accomplish. So just, um, to, I'm sorry, forgive me. Go ahead. I apologize. Okay. Um, we, I have another hand raised. Jay sure. Sard. Hello, hi. Um, my, my question goes to affordable housing uh, for families. Um, and my question basically is uh, in terms of uh, you, your organization, Ms. Mr. Lloyd, uh, a lot of the, in the zoning code, there's, um, I believe there, there's an incentive for studios, one bedrooms and two bedrooms. And my question or my comment also goes to the lack of housing for families, three bedrooms and more. That's affordable housing. So the way that the zoning code, uh, um, the last time I, I looked at it a while ago was was set up was there, is, is that for studios, one bedrooms and two bedrooms, you had sort of a bonus in the zoning resolution. That was not there for three bedrooms. I looked at the census, and the U.S. Census said that around in uh, um, in New York City and in Brooklyn, it's around four person or more families, four person or more units, housing units. It was around twenty two or twenty four percent. 22 to 24% in the city were four person or more units. So I look at it and I'm like, you know, I, I hear affordable housing for families and there's this working families party. And I'm like, this is housing for, for singles because most of the time you, know, you can't fit, you know, a family of four or more in usually in like a two bedroom. So my question first is, is there any talk in terms of housing for families, looking at the zoning code and even saying, look, we need maybe something for three bedroom or more that goes to the family's issue. The second thing on the, uh, um, on let's say the, the AMI issue in terms of what's affordable for like the, the area, which I know there's a lot of comments on, um, even though for affordable housing, 50% is for the local community for the residents. So in the, in the typical community district, 50% goes to the local residents, 50% will be outside of it. I understand that the AMI is based upon, I think the, uh, um, you know, the local metropolitan area. But when you're dealing just with the local community, that's 50% is going to get affordable housing. Doesn't it make more sense to match the, uh, the income of the local community district? Because otherwise, when you do the numbers and everything like that, you know, it, it's East Flatbush is not going to have the same numbers as, let's say, Tribeca with, with you know, with, with, with in terms of income. And so would it make sense to go to more of like a, a, a local AMI based upon the community district to make it the pool in that district more fair to, to more people who can get it. So my issue is uh, just a comment on, you know, also like th there's not affordable housing for three bedrooms or more, yet the city has, you know, so many four person or more families. The second is, is in terms of making it more affordable within uh, 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 the local community, if you're going to discriminate and say 
yes, we're going to hold 50% for it within that district. Why not match the income in that district? Because otherwise, when you go over the numbers, it doesn't match it, and, when, and it's not going to be the same pool. And then just, that, I'll, I'll leave it at those two. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Sure. So there is, you know, so the zoning has density regulations, which, reg, you know, regulate the average size of the apartments. However, you know, HPD, when there uh, does not, HPD typically exceeds that and builds more, uh, you know, family units um, because, you know, there are, of course, these are heavily regulated uh, projects on affordable housing where they're, you know, working with HPD who has very strict design di guidelines um, around it. So, you know, for instance, I was, we were talking about this with, uh, you know, some colleagues, some, uh, a member of ours, FIPS uh, neighborhoods. And they were talking about how often they tried to do multi bedroom, you know, 2, 3 or more bedroom apartments uh, to accommodate family. So it depends on developer depends on HPD. Uh, you know, our, our members don't typically get to the, to the smallest, um, you know, the smallest size as possible. Uh, I will say, though, that there are advantages um, on the, particularly on the market rate side to doing buildings with lots of studios and 1 bedrooms because that can absorb some demand. So, for instance, I've always lived in, uh, you know, like a, I live in a 3 bedroom apartment and I have a roommate. And so uh, sometimes you'll see that singletons out on their own can outbid a family because you're combining multiple breadwinners, multiple income earners. And so sometimes a building with studios and 1 bedrooms um, can absorb, uh, you know, it, it can absorb some of that demand for people who'd honestly rather live alone. Um, in terms of the other question about the AMI, so an area median income is a HUD tool that serves multiple missions. So it, on the one hand, it um, does provide uh, you know strict guidance for who can be housed in the long under buildings funded with low income housing tax credits. However, it also establishes eligibility for Section Eight vouchers. So because New York City is very expensive and the AMI is a bit higher because of this high cost area, it actually makes more families eligible for Section 8 vouchers. So that is one of the reasons that it is a bit higher and is to increase the number of folks who can apply for that. Um, and, you know, the community preference you mentioned, the 50% being available to local community members, the, the city already has a waiver from HUD to do that. Normally, you have to provide them equally to everyone, at least within the county. So, um, there is a tension in fair housing between, um, you know, focusing, making everything extremely oriented towards a particular community uh, as opposed to the whole city. What you'll see, for instance, in the, in the East New York rezoning is that they committed to, to using Ella as their primary term sheet, as the term sheet they would offer to private developers in East New York, which is the deepest affordability the city offers that's not supportive housing. So you do see in the planning that they use for affordable housing in these communities, a general um, a trying to meet the needs of those communities um, without necessarily providing a specific match. Um, so, Ms. James, do you want me to keep answering questions or I don't want to destroy, um, take your entire like meeting. Three, yeah, just three more meetings. Um, uh, Ms. Boyd, and then that'd be the last question. I do have a question. Um, hi, you, you talked about, again, you talked about your belief that the rezonings were very successful and the two rezonings. However, did not the community board object to the rezonings because they did not like the numbers, the MIH numbers, and did not the community board um, voted against those both rezonings, and yet they passed and there were no changes to the rezoning. Um, so your opinion is that it was successful, but it, it seems like the community board itself did not feel the same way. Um, and so how do you reconcile the fact that after the community themselves put this stuff, uh, put a good faith effort forward, produced a plan that they gave to the Department of City Planning that was rejected and then in turn created their own plan that the community board objected to, how do you now in good faith actually say that that was a good rezoning for the community when the community itself did not support the rezoning plan that was finalized? By the city council. Well, 
I would say that, you know, there are negotiations that happened and there were different uh, positions put forward as part of that negotiation. Um, there were actually extensive modifications to each of the rezonings. I personally wrote them. Um, so I'm very familiar with what we did um, to, to modify those rezonings uh, to address a vari you know, variety of concerns. You know, we read all the testimony that was provided and, and you know, we adjusted the plans accordingly. Um, you know, there's different roles within ULERP for different bodies. You know, of course, the community board, uh, as you all know, is an appointed body. Um, there's also, you know, the city council, you know, the elected members. So everyone, everyone has a different role to play. Um, you know, different bodies are empowered with different levels of authority under the statute. So, you know, I think that they were, yes, they were contentious as land use debates and rezonings often are. But uh, that's sort of my professional um, judgment, looking back on them in terms of the amount of affordable housing developed uh, and, and incredible you know, huge amounts of capital investment in the community. So that's just my take, um, look in the rear view mirror. You made the changes, so of course you would make that, take that position, wouldn't you? I mean, I don't think there were bad changes, but I would rather not, um, okay. this is about your community board 17, I'd rather not talk about Relitigate um, in when East New York, right? But um, you just you're bringing those up as as a way of supporting your position, and so I'm just trying to bring some clarity that those were very two very contentious rezonings that the community did not support at all, even when the minor changes were done to those rezoning applications were done and finalized. And in fact, one actually filed a lawsuit and it went all the way up to the second department, challenging the rezoning because of the racial impact. There was a, a belief that um, the rezonings actually spurred displacement. Um, and so there was a serious concern about the, the negative impact that actually happened to the local residents was a lot of communities and a lot of businesses and a lot of residents were actually removed from those communities because of this rezoning. So just, just to let's make sure that the record is clear and that we are aware that those were not what the community felt successful rezonings, even though developers might feel otherwise. Thank you. I, mean, I think it depends on what you define as the community. But Ms. James, I'm gonna, I think at that point, I think I should stop taking questions. Uh, okay, you thank you, Brian. And uh, just off the bat, um, I heard you mention about this is the worst area for insurance. Yes. New York City is very hard to insure. We have very high, extremely high insurance rates, and that drives up um, cost of construction, which makes it much harder to develop affordable housing. Yes. Are you talking about New York City or are you talking about this area? Particular? New York City, but you often, you do see redlining by insurance companies within New York City, um, often against communities of color. So it is when our members do work and they're working in lower income communities of color, it's much more challenging because of the redlining done by insurance companies. Okay. I just have one question. Um, like Jay, I identify the AMI as being the major issue in all of this. And I was originally going to ask you, well, how is it exact? Is it just a federal issue? Or is there any state involvement in it? But you explained why it was done to facilitate back then the section eight. So that was insightful because um, otherwise it was just creating chaos in New York City. Uh, so I guess my question for you then, is it best going forward to talk a uh, distinguish between affordable housing? Because if affordable housing, 60% of AMI of a hundred, you know, seven thousand dollars, you're talking about the minimum income of 60, you know, you give the numbers, you have the numbers versus deeply affordable. So um, would it be a good practice going forward when we talk about our community and the level of income in our community that we really need to be talking about deeply affordable versus affordable? Is that standard? Is 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 are those two terms? Um best distinguished? I mean, I think that when you, if you say, you know, deeply affordable, it's a good way of communicating the exact type of affordable housing you're interested in, right? So um, I think that's a, you know, a wise move. 
And you can also, you know, a lot of this is, you know, technocrats like myself who <laughs> engage in you know, a lot of jargon. And, you know, if you say, we, yeah, we're interested in affordable housing, we're interested in the Ella term sheet. That's a great way, for instance, of saying to folks exactly what you're interested in, um, which won't be a surprise at all uh, to, to anyone um, in the agencies. Uh, you know, they're very familiar with that sort of thing. But yes, deeply affordable housing is a good way of describing what you're specifically interested in. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, it was an opportunity to just get some, I say basic, but information on the guidelines that um, govern or establish affordable housing. So thank you very much. Okay. Sure. Um, Certainly, it was my pleasure, and I wish you all the best of luck in this uh, extremely um, fun process. So, have a lovely evening. Take care. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, to um, to um, to address that question about why is it included, um, as he explained, which we you know, I was not aware before because I was very I'm very I was incensed to to hear that they were including other counties in determining New York City's AMI, given the fact that we have 8 million people in New York City, right? Which represents the population of certain other states. <laughs> and so why wasn't it not broken down within just New York City? And even furthermore, just Brooklyn, which has 3 million people. Uh, but according to the explanation tonight, the reason that it was done was to increase it so that more people going to qualify for section eight, which makes sense. Um, if you think of it, if it was just based on, um, on a lower amount, if many people who were able to, um, to get section eight would have been priced out of it. So I guess it was, um, possible legitimate rationale for that decision. I just want to stop at this minute and to, um, take, um, uh, approve the minutes. Well, did everybody have an opportunity to go through the minutes last? Um, um, can I get a motion from a member to approve the minutes? Can I get a motion from a, um, I make a motion that we approve the minutes. Thank you. A second. Second. Can we approve minutes without a quorum? Um, well, if you don't really know what the quorum would be, I don't know. We're establishing a quorum tonight. I guess. Uh, so whoever is there, yeah, from the quorum going forward will be based on the people who, the number of people who've um, actually entered or either attended tonight or uh, submitted an application. So to that Second. point, we do. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay. All in favor? Any any abstentions? Who second the motion, please? Me, Asar, John. Thank you. Um, any corrections? Any hearing none? Um, all in favor? Can I just um, just hear I or? Hi. Uh, you just said hi. Hi. Okay, good. Hi. 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 Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, you see the challenge that we are facing. In a nutshell, we did not rezone back then when we might have had the opportunity. And right now, it's categorically clear that we are not going to be permitted to rezone unless there is some provision for affordable housing. So that was a specific reason I had this presentation tonight so we could glean some information as to how it works, what it is, and how we can address it. And so to that end, I, you know, it, it was very difficult because on one hand, it'd be very easy to say, let's look at, um, to save our housing stock. Perhaps we just look at the commercial strip, but at the end of the day, we're also gonna be displacing local businesses. And so I was pondering how best we can resolve this issue. And I reached out to Richard Barak at um, 
the department of um, the new the mayor's uh, office. And I think he came up with some good solutions as to how to address it. So let me just recap. Okay. We want to preserve our community as best as possible. We want development in a contextual way, rather than this unplanned development where you have skyscrapers, of course not, in the middle of like, <laughs> you know, one, two family homes. We want planned development. We also have to comply with New York City's uh, regulations with regard to rezoning, or it's not going to happen. I recall only too well when Bushwick was very insistent that they wanted to get it their way. Ultimately, they were not successful in rezoning, and it was never rezoned up until recently because of change. We don't want to be in that predicament. We have to work within the context, within the, the boundaries that we have, and find the optimal solution that will preserve our community, have planned development in um, a contextual zone. And, and even beyond that, we have residents who need affordable housing deeply affordable housing as well, too, mostly. So how can we do that? And so I think um, Richard Barak has some insight and some of them will turn the, um, ask him to speak to us. We should be done by nine o'clock, so it's not gonna be a long meeting, don't worry about that. But go ahead, please. Richard. Yes, so in regards to affordable housing, um, other neighborhoods tend to have more city owned property. Um, so it's easier to build affordable housing when you have property. And so one of the changes to try to spread out where affordable housing could be produced was based on this mandatory inclusionary housing plan, where if it was mapped, then the developer is above a certain size, so basically uh, more than 12 units would have to provide affordable housing at prescribed incomes, right? Some of that was talked about in your presentation. So your community does not really have, I think there's like one or two fragmented lots in the portfolio of the city's housing agency. Um, you also have other properties that the city owns it uses um for example you may have parking uh related to some of your police precincts uh library buildings um child care center senior center so some of these properties are built a lot less than the zoning rights are so in such cases it could be an opportunity to leverage a redevelopment of the property with affordable housing. A recent example of a library was in Sunset Park, where they rebuilt the library. They actually made the library larger and resulted in 54 of very affordable housing units. Uh, they weren't affiliated with the MIH program. It was based on a very low income housing program. So it reached incomes deeper than the MIH and again, 100% affordable. So um, you don't have probably too many options like that, but you might have a few. Um, beyond that, in the faith-based universe, some of your faith-based properties um, can be opportunities for affordable housing. Uh, one was fairly recent at 1488 New York Avenue where they developed 100% senior housing. Um, so the question is based on your existing zoning or zoning you may wanna have in the future, does that provide opportunities for your faith-based um, establishments to work with the city? Uh, most likely they'd be working with developers to take advantage of rights on their property to do affordable housing, again, with a faith-based institution, it doesn't mandate them to use the rights for affordable housing. Some of them may have financial needs. Some of them may wanna focus more on a, another social mission besides affordable housing, whether it be uh, food kitchens or other programs. 
child care center. So, but um, you may want to have a dialogue with the faith based institutions in your community to see if it makes sense to work with them within the context of rezoning where it could help meet community objectives. And beyond that, it's really how do you use the zoning tools that the city has um, where you might believe it's appropriate to add density to your neighborhood? And if it works out in balance with the Department of City Planning uh, to move ahead with a rezoning proposal that instead of properties developing and providing no affordable housing, or in the case of what just recently expired, the 421A, where a lot of developers chose an option of affordability that actually was pretty much around market rate housing, 130% of the area median income. So I'm sure if you looked at rents for studios and one bedrooms, a lot of them got into the $2,000, $3,000 range. Um, so it's hard to say how much of that housing went to the community, despite an, a lottery opportunity for 50%. Um, but that was probably much of the affordable housing that had happened in community district 17 in the last several years was based on that voluntary program that developers utilized. Um, exception was at 1488. Um, I'm not familiar with other affordable housing developments. You do have some at the fringe of the community district. Uh, state has an initiative that was called Vital Brooklyn under the prior governor. You have a couple of different developments happening just north of Clarkson, between Clarkson and Winthrop, and I think there's another one further up um, just north of Winthrop on, on the other hospital, Kingsbrook, I believe is that one. The question is, because they're a state property, you may have some of your board in the assembly member district that spills into District 17. I'm not sure how the state will look at local preference. Will Clarkson be a hard and fast line for local preference, or will there be some other metric chosen when they do the lottery on the state properties? Um, so. That's your typical realm of leveraging affordable housing for your community. Uh, I'll stop there, and if there's other questions or anything else, the chair would like me to talk about. Great. So I'll jump in and I'll give my I'll see what so for the task I would like to assign us. Then I'll take questions. Okay. The challenge before this committee is how can we come up with enough affordable housing that satisfies the city and that would enable us to preserve most of what we have. And so what Richard has um, shared with us this evening is that if we're able to identify within the community areas that can be utilized for affordable housing, then that would then satisfy the city and enable us to down zone. Okay. So what I would like to ask everybody here this evening is as you walk through the community, as you drive through the community, start thinking differently. Look at what's around us. And if we can identify buildings, for example, your church may be suitable for development. I would caution you about just approaching your pastor at this time, because if he does or she does, goes to a developer out there, very likely we will not end up with what we have. But if you can come back to the, um, to the committee and share the information where we can then as a committee, suggest it to the pastor and you show them a way it can be done, then that would be a better approach. So I'm asking you to identify areas. You may see a building. You see, uh, you mentioned the senior centers. Uh, the, we just, well, you know, we just did the library over, so I don't know how feasible that is, but we can entertain the idea. Let us do some homework. It may not be a nice word, but it's a good word. And see if we can identify areas within our community whereby we can find areas to expand to satisfy the city that we've met quote unquote the quota they have set for community board 17 in terms of affordable housing. Asa John. And I, I just want to quickly add one thing. Mm -hmm. Some of the properties 
that are being developed now, because you're having about 20 sites or so built in your community every year under the existing zoning. So a question to ask yourself, if that building would have been one story higher, two or three stories higher, and had affordable housing, would that affordable housing opportunity be more important than the building being the size? Like right now, uh, when they build the, the, the bulky buildings, uh, it's in your R6 area, it's mostly seven stories, except for narrow streets where it's five. In the northwest corner of the board, um, you have the R7 district, so you're having uh, eight stories built um, when they build bulky, except for where you have those strange lots that are very, very deep, like 200 feet deep, and then they've been building typically uh, 10 to 12 stories uh, because the bulky model doesn't work for them because the property's too long. Um, and then you've had just those couple of exceptions on those very, very large properties where you've had uh, two buildings more than 20 stories tall because the properties were very large and they decided not to build the bulkier option. Uh, so when you see things like one story retail, those are probably things developers are looking to get their hands on, maybe two story commercial, uh, maybe worth their while to buy and take advantage and build these six, seven story um, properties. So if you go look at what used to be there and what got built, and then you say, well, we still have more of those properties in our community. And if they were built that much taller, would I be happier because we leverage from affordable housing for the community? That's something you have to think about. Um, there was an exercise done on behalf of the community board, a fellow that they got through uh, a fund. I helped supervise it. The, the fellow looked at five or six corridors in your community, uh, Bedford, Rogers, Church, um, Utica and a few different places. And one other thing about Utica, a lot of Utica doesn't permit housing. So a question would be, should Utica in some places permit housing? So, so that's the kind of range of things to give thought to. Thank you. And uh, East 98th Street's another example, right, by the, where the uh, three train comes out. Yeah, that's targeted for some massive development. I'm not sure if that happened probably after you left Amber Hall. I'm not sure if you're aware of it. It's like a massive, like 12, uh, 12 buildings going up from East 98th Street. It's pretty massive. Um, Asa John. Yeah. So from what I'm hearing, Richard, in the beginning of what you said, in terms of looking at senior citizen centers and libraries. Um, that could be slated for possible development. I mean, the the problem, like I understand the whole point of if we want to get what we want, we would have to provide affordable housing um, along with the down zoning. However, like wouldn't developing those places like senior citizen centers and child care centers require tearing down the existing foundations and building something that's bigger or possibly higher, which is the sort of the opposite of what we want? Because we're looking for not as much development as we are dealing with right now. Um, I don't know. Some of them may be in a location, like if they're on a street like Nostrand Avenue or Rogers, it's very different than being on East 29th Street, a narrow street. So you really have to look at the context of the street. Um, like on an East 29th Street, four to five stories would be allowed as of right. So if it went from one story to four or five stories, is there enough economics to rebuild a brand new state of the art senior center to add four floors of housing above it? You know, it may or may not work, it may need a lot of subsidy um, because you got to subsidize the rebuilding of the, the facility. And, you know, you probably, this facility has probably got to be an aged facility where it's got some capital needs to fix it up anyhow. So if you're going to fix it up anyhow, this is an opportunity to revisit the property. You know, you're not going to do something that's in great shape just because it has extra zoning rights. You know, you wait 30, 40 years, maybe let it have its, you know, life of the, the improvement. 
Thank you, Hazel Martinez. Yes, I have two comments. One, um, I wouldn't put too much stock in the religious institutions making buildings because in 1488, um, the funding that they got did not give any preference to anybody living in Board 17. And we only had, um, I think only three people in the zip codes got a house, got a room in that place. And they brought in everyone else from the outside. So, so I mean, senior can... housing, um, depending on the program, yeah. certain things through the federal government, they have, um, I'll call it backward standards in terms of helping the immediate community get into senior developments. I've heard this in a few places. I haven't heard this about this one though. Um, so certain things that are tied to federal standards, you have to advertise to like the most unlikely to get in situation. So it, it does tilt the playing field against um, the local community, but it does help an important citywide need when senior housing gets built. So it may not be helping your community directly, but there's such a shortfall of senior units in New York City. So it's still an important resource to contribute to the city. Well, our whole purpose is to help our community. And since our community did not really benefit from that, we have a lot of bitterness in the community about it and a lot of negativity in terms of this whole zoning business now, because people felt that they were actually, you know, they were misled. Again, I can't speak to how the marketing went and the outcome. And I, the other I think that. Sorry, that's why I said, uh, suggested that before we, you know, let's, there are programs out there whereby a church could get funded and not be subject to federal guidelines, for example, that require that they make it available to everyone. So if we can direct the pastors in the community as to that source of, of financing, then it increases the possibility probability of local people in the community getting those because many churches would want to actually give the apartments to members in the church in the congregation right <laughs> they're not trying to to provide um, housing for people living out in queens or long island uh, so it's a matter of providing them with the information that they need to be able to make the right decision for their faith-based institution as well as the community uh, Margarita Vigilante was next. Margarita Vigilante was next. Sorry. Yes. Hi. Um, I I just like to cut through a couple of layers here. Um, is there a number? I I know the last administration. I don't remember how much it was. De Blasio wanted a certain amount of affordable housing units built in total. So what is the number now? Is it still the same number? What is that number? And how do you portion it? Per borough within the city, does everybody, you know, it's like if it's a 500,000 units, does each borough have to provide 200,000 units or 150,000 units to meet that? Is is there a percentage? Like, how is it fair? Do we get credit for what's already been built? Um, is there like a quota? I, I, that's a lot, but do you understand my question? Yeah. Well, first of all, the city's short on the number of units it needs, right? We have people in shelters right now, so we're already at a deficit. We have people living in illegal units, right? So, so you yeah, know, so what's the number? Right. So, like, whether you count that unit as a unit or not, because it's substandard, um, we have people living doubled up. We have people who are becoming artificial families because they decided it's more important to live with three or four younger people in the work world because they can't afford their own place. So we have people who are paying a lot more rent than the standards suggest they should pay. So we definitely have a housing challenge. We're behind. You know, we have more people moving into New York City. Uh, COVID was a little hiccup on that, but we have people moving in. Uh, so, yeah, I understand that, but know, I, I so, mean, okay, that's, so so that's need, all malleable, that's all changeable, but do you have a number? Is there a number? 
right now that you yeah. want to meet? Well, Barbara there's no official government number, okay. but people who are advocates, affordable housing advocates, throughout numbers, um, but it's a combination of numbers. It's not just affordable housing, it's market rate housing. So you always need more housing units. The city has watched permits issued. They range from 20, 30,000 units a year, give or take some units, some years have been worse. We really haven't had too many years much better than 30,000, but not that long ago, 50 years ago, the city was probably building 50, 60,000 a year. So, you know, in order to help the city meet its housing need, it's going to take a lot of units coming in from a lot of different places. And the question is, if you build a market rate unit, does somebody not displace somebody in another unit because they had a new unit? There's a, there's a whole lot that goes into that. Right. Well, but what I'm trying to focus on is more what is our responsibility as this community? You know, how much do we have? I, I don't think it's defined. Right. I don't so, think there's, I don't think know, there's any known sense. Right. Well, so that, I mean, sort of like that's just kind of up in the air then, because we've already built so much on the west end of the community board. So, you know, we've already done a lot. So doesn't that get into like the quota of how much we have to build going forward? You know, if you look at how many permits were issued in community district 17 and you compared that against so many other community districts, you may not be so high on the list. You know, certain areas like Long Island City, Williamsburg, Greenpoint, and Brooklyn alone, downtown Brooklyn, their unit count is way higher than what's happened in your community in the past year, past sure, but five, ten years. There's a number that are lower than us also. So, like, where do we fit in? I, I, I don't have an answer for you. Uh, I'm this not sure how this will play out, but there's a lot of need. So, the question is, can we meet the need? That that's the challenge the city has for itself. I don't want to speak for. I I think ultimately the question is: Are we going to be fooling ourselves if we endeavor to find ways to increase affordable market rate housing in the community, and then having identified, having facilitated, having done everything that we need to do that? Is it more likely than not the city is going to turn around and say we still can't down zone? I think that's that's a fundamental question. Uh, so if that was a question for me, can you do that one more time? Yes. <laughs> I was trying to catch so up on the, the chat. Base, yeah, I understand. The, 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 the primary question here is if we as a rezoning committee, if we as a community board do what we, we 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 think is being told of us to find ways to increase housing and we find we, we strategize to do it in a way that does not destroy the community nor does it result in unplanned development where persons who don't live in the community just come in and do whatever they want if we can find an organized and strategic way to increase the housing uh, stock in our community Having done that, are we still going to then be told at the end of this, oh, guys, you can't rezone? That's the basic issue on the table right now. I, I really can't zone. answer you that. Can't and, you know, zone. also because you're looking to have uh, protective zoning, right? Down zoning in some places. So, in theory, where you have that one or two family house that's been knocked down and they're putting in eight units, right? Your goal is not to have that happen very much more, right, in a lot more cases. So you start saying all these six and eight units that you are precluding on one hand, so you're going in both directions. So I don't, you know, even if you ended up where, well, we're gonna create this many units, but we're also trying to block this many units. You know, I, I don't know what the balance will be and I don't know if the balance matters because the one big difference right now is in your current situation, you're not really generating affordable housing. So let's say if you balance between protecting homes and creating growth opportunities, the number may be almost identical, but the difference in the identical is 20%, 25% may be affordable housing. So it's like 
you're not really growing units. You're simply trading capacity to leverage affordable housing. So it's hard to say if you're even going to be asked by a plan to do more units than what gets taken away. It's just that you'd be contributing units that leverages affordable housing where right now you don't really have that. So it's really hard to say what the outcome would be of, you know, looking at opportunities and looking at protection opportunities and seeing how it would fall. I, I, I don't have a magic. I, I think trying to be responsible on your end, um, honest about where you can tolerate more height than you're used to. And again, knowing a lot of the places you see the height, the allowable height may be seven stories. So just because you see one or two, um, you have to think in the context of what's allowed in that block, not really always what's there. Because some of those cases you want to bring the height opportunity down. Um, and the question is where you're comfortable going higher than what's allowed now. But I, th I thought the conversation was in, in, in the context of contextual rezoning. I mean, that's what the city uses and that's what other communities have, that privilege. So I don't know why in our community it would be structured in terms of your block and things, but rather that we want, we want development that is in keeping with con con contextual zoning. So it's very- And there's two types of way of looking at contextual zoning. One is having buildings being kind of like what's on the block. And then the other form is where you're looking at growth is you kind of know the number of stories. You don't have to worry that someone's going to figure out how to do a 15 story building. You know up front that's a nine story block. And so that's another form of contextual zoning where you're controlling the future heights where you want to allow growth instead of letting it be where, oh, I found that quirky property. I figured out how to do 23 stories on it. Alison Martinez. Um, actually, I think Alicia's hand was up before mine. Okay, Alicia. I, um, has the city made an agreement um, to do down zoning? Because I know underneath the de Blasio administration, there was not one down zoning that was done within um, the rezoning has there been a commitment by the department of city planning who actually will be the applicant of record for rezoning for this community have they agreed that they were going to consider a down zoning and that they would agree to a down zoning if you gave them you know up zoning so i think the initial focus has been more on these citywide tax changes that are now being discussed publicly uh, and so i, I I don't think it's gotten to the next level of looking at how else to um, use zoning in the communities right now. Again, doing things on a citywide basis has been the initial approach, and it is labor and time consuming. It's you know taking up a lot of resources. So that's, that's what, to date what I can only tell you. I can't tell you beyond that because really that's what the focus has been now. So there has been no agreement by the city that if this community engages in a rezoning that they would actually come up with a down zoning where they would actually down zone and take away billable space from property owners. I can't say that's been a conversation. I've not been part of any conversation. I just can't speak to it. Okay, thank you. A couple of things. I just think we don't need to start from scratch. We have some survey data of some sectors that could be looked at and we should be using that as a basis to either revamp certain things add on based on the fact that some years have elapsed since then but we don't need to start from scratch we need to get actually more community engagement going to make sure that we can teach community about what we have existing get their feedback to add on to it and then build up our numbers of support so that when we're going to city agencies and the like we can say we have a record of this many people supporting this type of project i also think we shouldn't be just focusing solely on where we can increase housing we need to be looking at a holistic approach of all of the things that we need in the community and bring those to the table 
the DCP meeting we had, it was clear that they are at least interested in helping us to address other issues like infrastructure and all of that with other city agencies, state agencies as well. So we need to be looking at ways to strategize design for the all of the needs that we have and not just focusing on what one in, intention that the city has, but looking at what we need. So that that's my concern. I don't want us to devolve into you know, where can we give up stuff without thinking holistically about what we need in terms of the new zoning um, initiatives for, you know, jobs, environment, still sustainability, also racial impact and requiring those things. We need to be thinking a lot more broadly and in really some ways leading the city to where we need to do go in terms of community needs and, and really designing for with a community centered focus. Great. I mean, can you bring that up at the board meeting? Because I, you know, you mentioned things that would probably be best addressed. For example, if you're talking about parks, the park, the parks commi uh, committee, uh, social services, or if there is a job, whatever it is. I mean, I don't know. We can't stretch ourselves too thin, right? We can't address every need that the community has. So it'd be wonderful if you're able to at the next board meeting bring up that issue. So that holistically, the board can uh, focus on all these issues and make them, you know, together we can work through them. So you're right; it has to address all, you know, the economic impact, packs, and the infrastructure. Is that something that transportation needs to get involved? Um, we can't have our hands in all the fires at the same time, though. It'd be very really difficult to do that. I think that in the resolution, I believe every committee was supposed to have a member on this committee or some representative so that they could actually help do the work <laughs> of carrying this forward and educating because at the end of the day, most of the people who are on this committee are not going to be voting. So that means we need people, the board members to educate themselves so they can know what they're doing when they're actually voting. And the other part I wanted to bring up too about the churches is I want us to be very careful with that because most churches in the end of the day as far as I'm concerned, have been scammed <laughs> in that. And they have, you know, some of them did never got the church that they were promised in the end. And the reality is they are not the the, the people that they partner with, they are they're not well equipped or versed on how to build capital stacks that will be able to provide the housing for people who are directly from the community. And the reality is those that's the hardest way to get money. So that's usually not the path that a developer is going to take. So and that is not going to be, you know, the best option. And that's exactly right. So that's why I said don't approach a pastor. Okay. If you have if you have identified a bill a, 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 a church that has a potential, let's come back to this 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 committee. Let's discuss it. And see if we can find our and we do the research, direct them to whatever source of funding whereby they can do the property and own it. Because many of the churches, as you said, were scammed, they ended up not owning the properties, right? All the income from the apartment is going to a developer, and that does not benefit the church. That's why that's how I first got involved in rezoning, uh, because I saw churches being scammed. Okay. So that's something I'm very passionate about. So we wouldn't, I don't think anybody here should be ready talking to the pastor as yet, because we need to get information, get a package and say, well, okay, here, these are the resources available to you where you can get funded, which would permit you to give you the freedom to be able to rent to your members. And at the end of the day, the church owns the property, not some developer. Because many of them end up either selling their rights um, leasing them or leasing the space, they, they didn't get the full benefits that they could have gotten otherwise. Um, I think it was Hazel Martinez next. Um, and we, we want to wrap up in the next uh, okay. 10 minutes. Uh, my, sorry, my comment is frankly, I am, I'm, I thought, I think, um, our rezoning efforts had to do also with helping to, um, protect the the current residents from the um, displacement that people were experiencing with these as of right buildings, whereas these, I think there should be a moratorium on as of right building in this community where the developer gets to do whatever they, it's free for all in board 17 right now. But 
I am not concerned with who's coming to New York City or anything else right now. I'm concerned with the residents that actually live here, have spent their lives here, and have put and and um cannot afford to live here any longer. That should be really one of our focuses because we are seeing buildings go up. And yes, new residents are coming here, even in the quote affordable houses, but it's not the people who have lived here for many, many years. Point well taken. Um, uh, Asa, um, John, and then Sydney, and I think we need to wrap up. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, I feel like a lot of the conversation has been around like affordable housing and development that we're not exactly sure is going to even be affordable when it comes. And I think that like we should just as a group develop solutions that we can fix right now um, and not have to wait on a rezoning that, you know, could happen in the next three, two or three years. Um, and I think that just be means like us as a group being more engaged in the community and seeing what are the ways around like having to build all of these you know, buildings while, you know, sacrificing the character of a community. I mean, one of the things that Richard said, um, you, it had to do with, uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, I had posed this in the chat, but it had to do a lot with um, other neighborhoods that saw large development, such as Williamsburg and Greenpoint. Um, and I had asked, you know, like, do we have to match these the, the these, those neighborhoods numbers in terms of their development in order to meet like the affordable development? Um, uh, the need and to me, like that doesn't really make any sense because if we are trying to match the numbers of these other neighborhoods, the whole community is going to be gone. Like, if you look at the size of the buildings in those other neighborhoods, you know, they're skyscrapers. So, like, to me, that's not really making sense. Um, I think there just needs to be like something more concrete that we can do now instead of waiting on the city to go through uh, a rezoning because our community is being torn apart. Um, <laughs> as we speak each week, you know, there's 3 projects that are going to start on Glenwood road soon. Um, and how are we supposed to live in this community while all of that is going on at the same time? That's just my concern. Okay. So I encourage you at the next board meeting to raise and that. By the way, as long as people are willing to sell their properties. That creates the development opportunities. So, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to say, well, don't sell your property. Or make sure you're selling it to someone who wants to live in a house that you love for the last 30 years. It's a hard dynamic to accomplish. So, you know, that that's it's when people have land that's worth more than their house and they take that price that's more than they may have gotten from somebody else, you know, unfortunately that's a hard dynamic to stop. Thank you. Um, so, John, I would encourage you to come out to the board meeting and to raise those concerns so that the committees that are bet better able to address those issues would then be able to address them. There are many things I think you've talked a lot about uh, the, the quality of life, life the, the disrespect with which developers are treating our community. That's something that the board as a whole uh, when you identify the particular projects, can write to the, I mean, uh, notify the city and have it addressed. So thank you. Okay, um, we're going to freeze this after this. Uh, those four people, um, Sydney, Brock, I think your hand was next, then Adele, then Hazel, and very briefly Jay, and so we can end at least by 9.30. Thank you, Sydney. Okay, thank you, Ms. James. Um, just a couple of points, and, and these have been hashed on by other folks, but but first and foremost, um, I think to Allison Martinez's point, if I'm catching her name correctly, I do think that zoning is critical to many of the other aspects of what we have going in the community board, right? Because zoning determines traffic patterns, residential versus commercial. It's really at the heart and the fabric of the other things that we're talking about here, not just affordable housing. So the, the, the first thing, and I apologize uh, if I'm late to the party on this, uh, having now sitting in on this meeting for the first time. Late. <laughs> yes, very late, right? So, so uh, but, but to me, I think that having an overall strategy, uh, I think is critical versus this one-off approach or what 
again, from my perspective, seems to be a very narrow approach. So again, coming in late, it you know, uh, I do think that a, a overall strategy needs to be undertaken. And then secondly, you know, when you look at the process that that zoning requires just for a building, um, us undertaking this rezoning uh, challenge, my question is, well, what's the end game to that in terms of how long? So how long does rezoning come up for a bid? You don't have or or a vote. You don't have to answer that now, but it just seems like this entire process is is very long. And if you don't have a comprehensive strategy to say go to where the puck is going, so to speak, and not where it is, true. I think I think we're going to be always behind the curve uh, relative to what's taking place. So I'll stop there uh, because I know there are other people that 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 you know have questions and or or statements or comments, but that's where I will leave it. Yeah. To to your to your um to your point, uh, at the next um, committee meeting, we will spend some time listen to everyone and try to come up with a comprehensive plan that we can actually implement. Right? It doesn't make sense coming for a plan that we can't. It has to be something within our resources to accomplish. So that will be on the agenda next week to come up with a comprehensive plan that we can then um, get community support for. The next yeah. person, I'm going to, Adele Burnett was next, and Hazel and Jay, and then I think at 9.30 we want to um, end the meeting. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Hi, um, it's me, Adele. Listen, what I want to say is we need to use everything at our disposal. And you mentioned deed restrictions. That is key important, especially in residential areas where they want to convert them to 12, 15 story buildings. If that restriction is in place, then they can't do it. You're right. And it's a legal tool that's available to us. And, you know, it's, it's for us to be able to use it. Absolutely. Because I've seen a ship. A sh people shift and they're bringing in new people making you homeless and, and they're making it out of us and that's not good so like i can tell you it i will be there you're breaking up we'll be at the next meeting and i definitely need that tool Mark, i can, can identify all properties that have that deed restriction i can tell you it works because i saw a project over a close to a quarter of a billion dollars come crashing, come come to a full stop because of it. it yes, I mean it's a <laughs> it's a legal tool that's a bit a right. The same, put it to you this way: the same way that developers have the right, what they call it, the right to um, <laughs> you know, what I'm talking about mm -hmm. right. Oh, we have the right. Well, that's also a right within our hands to use and it's up to us to utilize it. Thank you, Adele. Thank you. Um, okay, Hazel and then Jay and then they're saying good night. I just want to um, respond to Mr. Barack in a way because um, a lot of people have been scammed into selling their homes. They are not just selling them free will and the, and the developer is not giving them the full worth of their value of their home there because they're in it to make business. People are told they can move south. There are all kinds of scams. I mean, just re this week alone, I've received at least 3 notices to, um, to sell my home and I mean, and they're being cheated out of their homes as well. Thank you, Jay. Mm -hmm. Yes, I just wanted to follow up on some uh, statement that Mr. Barak made uh, in, in which he informed very helpfully that uh, residents in Community Board 17 may not get access to the uh, affordable housing units in Community Board 9 that's on Clarkson Avenue, even though everything on Clarkson Avenue is just on the border. Clarkson Avenue, the, the vital Brooklyn is a monstrosity of what's of what's what's about to happen. It's it's where the Euler process is thrown out. Um, the zoning regulations in terms of where people decide upon with Euler is thrown out. So what you have is there's a 900 unit project project that's happening at the corner of Albany and Clarkson. There's, uh, to my knowledge, there's no requirement of, of parking because it's affordable housing in the transit zone. 
Then there's Utica Crescent, which is where Kingsbrook Jewish is. They, they're putting up a 12-story building because there's no ULERP, and they're going to get away with the 12-story building. It's 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 New York State uh, Urban uh, New York State Urban Development Corporation Act, which basically says you could ignore uh, uh, um, the ULERP. So you got a 12-story building, two of them, where Kingsbrook Jewish is going, was and still is, and that's only half of the project. And they're going to do they're going to terrifically go from Albany straight to Utica, and once they're doing that 12-story building. Now the church across the street uh, on Rutland in Schenectady, they also want to build a 12-story building. So what happens is you have this New York State land uh, in which they are, uh, uh, it's not subject to ULERP. And that is causing a tremendous amount of building. And, and, and there's going to be, in my opinion, displacement, not based upon price, but because people aren't going to have parking. When you build 900 units on Albany and Clarkson, when you build 322 units, on uh, 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 Rutland and uh, uh, near Utica, and there and there's minimal parking. People are going to be fighting over that. So I, I I wish that the two community boards can get together and can and can combine their resources on looking at what's going to be the effect of all that land where the community doesn't have a say. And if the communities can get together, go to maybe housing meetings, committee meetings, maybe uh, alert meetings or board meetings, it would be fantastic. So I and I I sent out emails to. Uh, some people from community board nine who I think showed up also, but if they combine, that would be great because vital Brooklyn is going to affect people in community board 17 in terms of cars and also the oversaturation of the homeless shelters that they're building. They're building 285 more units on, uh, Clarkson, on Clarkson and Albany. That's new. That's going to come. That's in addition to the four. Canva has two of them across the street. There's two homeless shelters that exist. There was a fifth one that was put from, uh, uh, you know, breaking ground last year. So it's basically affordable housing uh, on Clarkson. Almost half of the units are going to the homeless also. It's, so there's there's a lot of issues. Thank you. Thank you for inviting okay. me. So what I will what I will do is to arrange for someone from Vital Brooklyn to speak um, as soon as possible because some of the information that you you just said um, I know it to be incorrect. Um, and first of all, the the buildings that are going up are what you call deeply affordable where the rents are under a thousand dollars a month so we have three bedroom apartments for like 1400 and studio apartments for seniors starting at three four hundred dollars and there is parking but i that's a conversation that vital brooklyn is um is i will um invite them to speak so that they can actually make a presentation and show to the community what exactly they're going to um, be, be building so that there is no lack of clarity as to whether it's affordable or deeply affordable because it's my understanding my knowledge that those apartments are deeply affordable what we need to do as a community is to make sure that we, have, we have people in place who can very quickly apply uh, to be able to get those apartments uh, so that's not all right. arrangements to have what Right. Just to follow up, I've been doing a, a FOIL request to Vital Brooklyn. They haven't responded to me in over 14 months. And there's the, my issue is not on whether it's deeply affordable. I'll grant you that. My issue is if they're building, what is the parking requirement? They haven't disclosed it. That's my issue. There, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the, the, <laughs> there is more than enough parking, but I will I, let them address it. At, yeah. at that. I mean, I can't speak for all, all of other projects. I know for a matter of fact that the building on Utica Crescent does have something like over 200 parking spots. For, for the for the uh, hospital residents, when you do the analysis um, of how many there are, there's maybe 40, maybe 50 or 60 spots. It's, it's okay, important. So I'm digressing right now, I'll let them address it. But I guess the perspective was that if the rents are geared towards persons whose income is less than $20,000 a year, where they qualify to pay rent of Four hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, a thousand dollars. That the likelihood of them having in the, the, their income to be able to have a car. Um, so that's a factor. I mean, I'm sure there's some analytics that goes into it, and that that would that would determine the amount of parking spots allowed. Or I can tell you that you know, three bedroom apartment would be going for something like one thousand two hundred dollars. Okay, we we could speak okay. more. Great, thank you. Okay, great. Um, 
And Hazel, do you have one closing comment? And then I will, you have two more minutes. <laughs> or was your hand up before? I'm sorry, I didn't take it down. Okay, so good. We have been we're able to conclude the meeting at 928. Again, I want to thank you um, for having a very productive evening. Let's just, just be very clear. Um, I invited someone to speak on affordable housing to educators about what is involved in affordable housing. It didn't necessarily mean that all the opinions of that person are going to be shared by everybody on the board, but there's something that we all learned tonight, hopefully, that will better equip us to be able to make the right decisions because we are faced with a challenge that we are not going to be able to uh, have contextual zoning unless we provide for more housing. And that's just unfortunate, but that's a result of the fact that 17 years ago, when this yep. should have been done, it was not done. And we are living with what the, the reality is right now, unfortunately. But we, our goal should be as bad as the situation I is. I don't care who's coming here. I ain't care. Oh. So, so I, I think the perspective should be as bad as it has gotten. How can we at least slow it down to the point where we as community residents are treated with respect in our community? Thank you very much, and I appreciate you coming out tonight. And please think of, you know, trying to formulate in your minds on piece of paper, preferably, what you think the mission and the goal should be. And we are going to collaboratively uh, next month come to come together, collaboratively, of course, and um, formulate a vision and a mission statement that we can practically, as a community, as a as a committee, implement. We want this to be real. We want at the end of this process to have some tangible impact in the community. Thank you very much. A uh, motion to uh, bring this meeting to an end. Make a motion to end the meeting. Adjourn, adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. All in favor? Aye. 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 Again, thank you to thank you to Richard for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. We we'll have you out at nine thirty at night time. Uh, you've been a valuable source for this community, and we rely on you. And we thank you very much. Have a good evening. Good Stay good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, bye. Thanks. Bye. Really, really strong comebacks, and and his opponent Oz was first of all he also fumbled right i fumble on television right so it's a, the, the various definitely fumble was on television. Television. yeah